Hello, everybody. I'm Theo Hartzell of Theo Hartzell Ministries, where we help build, equip, and empower the people of God to be everything they can be for God. Perhaps you've been in storms and situations, and maybe you're in one right now where you feel like it is a critical moment for you to hear the voice of God and for you to get an answer to your prayer, and yet nothing is coming. And you're struggling and wondering, where are you, God? I need you right now in this moment. I am desperate. Perhaps you're struggling and you're saying, God, where are are you at? I need you. I am so desperate to hear your voice. I am so desperate to get out of this situation right now. But God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your struggle. He knows your battle. He knows what you're fighting through. But understand this, sometimes we may not hear the voice of God because God's trying to get us to process through something and walk us through something to set us up for something later. Sometimes when God is silent, it's because he's got you in a setup for a comeback. His silence may actually be a miracle for you somewhere down the road. You may feel like perhaps God doesn't know where you're at, but he knows exactly where you're at. And not only does he know where you're at right now, but he knows where you're going to be. And sometimes the knowing where you're going to be in the future is just as important as where you are today and what you're going through today. You don't know the seasons and the storms that you're going to face tomorrow. You feel the pain of what you're suffering right now and you feel and understand the situation you're going through right now. But I've got great news for you. God has given me a great revelation and understanding, and I want to release this thing to you also for you to be blessed. Stick with me. I'll be right back. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back and thank you for joining me today. Today, I want to talk to you about how sometimes the silence of God is actually setting you up for a blessing later on in the story. You may not feel it. You may not see it. You may not believe that God's even anywhere close to your situation, but I want you to understand that God can be right in the middle of your situation, even though it appears that he's not speaking to you. I want to go to the story of Elisha and the woman of Shunem. This woman was a very wise woman. Apparently, she was very wealthy. I don't know what her upbringing was, who her parents were, what she had been through in her life, but one thing that I do know is she could recognize the power and the presence of God when she saw it. When everybody else just dismissed Elisha and just paid attention to him just like a, an ordinary or a regular traveler, she saw something about him that was absolutely and totally different. And she told her husband, she said, I perceive that this is a great man of God. And she, she went to her husband and she said, look, I want to make room in our house for him. I want to build a room on the house. I want to put a bed in there a table, a chair, a lamp stand for him. And she wanted to just make sure that she provided him a place to stay and she was going to provide him food and water and give him things to eat. And she said, anytime that you come to town here, you are always welcome in my home. And so we see that she just made room in her life and in her house for Elisha to come in and stay. And so you're going to see through this story that as she made room for a man of God in her life or made room for the anointing of God, she made room for a covering for the man of God, that that ends up coming back in great exponential blessing for her throughout this story. So one day Elisha comes into town and he comes in and if you will he just kicks his feet up on the table and he's just enjoying kicking back sitting there. He's probably got a gift basket there, a bottle of water. He's refreshing himself. His servant Gehazi is with him and as he's sitting there meditating and thinking about what this kind gesture is that this man and woman have done for him, he begins to realize, you know what, as they have blessed me, so I want to bless them. He called for Gehazi and said, Gehazi, go call this Shunammite woman to come before me. The woman comes before him and he asks her, he says, look, what do you want? Do you want me to talk to the king for you? Do you want me to talk to the captain of the host for you? What do you want? And she said, look, I'm fine. I'm, I'm content. I dwell among my own people. I don't need anything. And so she went back on her way with nothing. But Elisha is not content to just leave her like that because he knows that she's got to have some desire in her heart somewhere. Now, I don't know what this woman's been through in her life, but it's almost like she doesn't want to get her hopes up. I don't know what dreams that she had already had that have been crushed. I don't know what she expected out of life that it looks like it hasn't manifested for her. I don't know what she had really wanted to do with her life, but for some reason, she's afraid to get her hopes up, almost like they've been dashed and crashed over and over. And so one thing that we do see is he calls Gehazi and he says, look, you know, do you know anything that this woman wants? And he said, well, look, one thing that I do know is that she doesn't have a son. And he's like, oh, there's, there it is. And he said, call her back. And so he calls the woman back and he says, woman, about this time, this season, you're going to have a child. 
And you might ask yourself, well, what is the importance of that? The importance of that is because sometimes the miracles of God or the blessings of God or the answers of God, they do take a process of time. So even though you may get a word, you may get a, a revelation, you may get an understanding, or maybe you understand that God's about to start working in your situation, that might not mean it's gonna be in the next five minutes or the next 10 minutes or the next 30 minutes, but just relax and just hold on because God is moving in the situation and God is working and he's at work. Just relax and give him time to do the things that he needs to do in your situation. It worked the same way with Abraham and Sarah. When he came to them and told them they were going to have a child, he said at this season, next season, that you're going to have a child. There's a process that you have to go through. Sometimes there's a miracle, which is an instantaneous thing, and then sometimes there's things that are like healings or process of time. They, they come gradually. Just relax. Just relax. Sometimes the answer of God is on the way, but it's growing and moving, and it will be born in due season. And that's what this woman had happened to her. At the due season, at the due time, she had the child, the thing that she wanted, but she was a little afraid to have. So one day this child is working in the field and he begins to scream, my head, my head. And they took the child to the mother, laid the child in the mother's lap, and she sat there and and I can see in my mind right now that this woman just goes into travail and intercession. Mothers out there, fathers, if you've ever had a sick child, you know what I'm talking about. When it looks like your child is on its deathbed and about to die, you find a serious prayer inside of you that maybe you didn't even know you had. You begin to try to touch the hem of the garment. You try to shake and rattle the throne of God and you start praying prayers like you haven't prayed. Why? Because if you've ever sat beside the bed of someone that was just about to pass from this life, you know what it's like to pray desperate prayers. If you've ever had to sit beside a casket and, and, and bid somebody goodbye, you know the pain of finding something desperate to pray. You know what it's like to pray desperate prayers. And so they've taken this child. They don't know what to do. They don't have medicine. They don't have doctors. They take the child and they put it in the mother's lap. And the mother does exactly what a mother should do. She begins to pray and she begins to try to intercede and call on God. But the answer doesn't come. The answer that she's looking for doesn't come. And about noon, that child dies. And so she sends a message to the father and she says, Says, hey, the child died, but I've got to get it. I got to get to the man of God. And I don't understand what's going on inside of this man. I don't know whether he's burdened with all the responsibilities that he has going on, or I don't know if he's not religious. I don't know if that was part of their problems about even wanting a child. I, I don't know what's going on in their life and their relationship and their marriage. But one thing that I do know is the man does not seem interested in her going to the preacher. He's like, it's not a new moon. It's not a Sabbath day. What do you want to go talk to the man of God for? But I am so proud that this woman did not give up regardless of how her husband responded this woman was a woman of faith i don't know what her parents who her parents were but I do know that they put the fear of God in her and they taught her to have a relationship with God. And when all other options were exhausted, the one thing and the one person that she was going to trust in is God. And she said, you know, forget everything else. Forget the harvest. Forget the work in the field. Forget it all. I'm worried about my baby right now. And I'm going to the one place that I do know that I can go to right now. And that's to the man of God because I've made provision in my life for the man of God. And as she goes to the man of God, the man of God is looking at her and he cannot perceive. This is the important thing that I want you to understand. He sees her and he knows her so well that he recognizes her from afar off and he turns to his servant Gehazi and he says, Gehazi, go, there's that woman from Shunem. Go, go talk to her and see what's going on. And you see that Gehazi runs to the woman and he says, hey, what's going on? What's wrong? And she says, all is well. She doesn't tell him nothing. She is not going to let anything deter her from getting to the man of God, the point of contact in her life. And so she comes to to the man of God, Elisha, and she falls down at his feet. And one thing that is of notice here is that Elisha says, I'm just paraphrasing, okay, but he says, I've been trying to hear the voice of God in this situation, but God has hid it from me. I can't discern what God is in the middle of this situation. He asks her, he says, is everything well with you? Is everything well with your husband? Is everything well with the child? And I want you to notice the difference in comparison of personalities here. The Bible says that Gehazi came up 
and tried to push her away. And Elisha's like, stop, what are you doing? What are you doing? She's grieved in her soul. She's burdened, she's hurt, she's suffering right now. This is a grief of her soul and God has hid it from me. I don't know what's going on. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that Elisha was in a critical moment with someone very dear to him, someone that he cared about, someone that had provided him with shelter, a place to stay, a place to live, giving him a bed to sleep in, giving him food to eat and water to drink. And, and he's wanting to touch the throne and the, the hem of the garment for her, but he can't. He can't hear from God. He can't discern what it is. But all of a sudden, all that hurt and that pain in her starts welling out and comes out. And she says, oh man of God, didn't I tell you, don't lie to me. In other words, don't get my hopes up. I told you I didn't want a child. I didn't want to have my hopes crushed. I didn't want to have my dreams dashed again. I didn't want to have my heart broken again. And now my son's been taken away. And Elisha says, oop, there it is. It's the child. And notice what Elisha does. Elisha turns to Gehazi and he gives his rod to Gehazi and he says, I want you to take this rod and I want you to take it, my rod, and I want you to put it on the face of the child. I want you to put it on the child. Don't even salute anybody. Don't wave hi. Don't say hello. Don't talk to nobody. I want you to just go and I want you to get to that child immediately. Why is that important? Because you can see in the context of the story how much Elisha loves the woman for what she's done for him. And you can see that there is a favor of God that comes on you when you make room in your life for God and the people of God to be in your life. They will try to move heaven and earth for you. They will pray for you when no one else will pray for you. When even the people in your own life don't even care what's going on in your situation, I'm telling you the people of God will come around you with loving arms and prayerful support and they will just raise up a standard against the enemy in prayer and fasting and love and support. And we see this going on. Elisha's like, don't you slow down for nothing. Don't even wave hi to anybody. Don't you say hi to anybody. You get to that child and you lay my rod on that child. And so Gehazi runs ahead and he does exactly what the man of God says. But unfortunately, the child is not raised. Now, in my mind, I cannot understand what's going on and I can't speak for what's going on in Gehazi's mind. But one thing that I do know is that the Bible says that Gehazi came running back and met Elisha and the woman of Shunem on the way to the child. And I don't remember where Elisha told him, go do that and then run back and tell me whether it worked or not. I don't see that anywhere in the story. The last thing that I saw Elisha tell him to do was Gehazi, don't salute nobody, go put my rod on this child. Why is that important? And why do you think I don't overlook that? I don't overlook that because I don't believe Elisha was expecting Gehazi to come back with a good report or a negative report, either one. I think he meant for Gehazi to go and sit there and obey and do it until he was able to get there. But this is one of the key points that I want to bring out to you today is so many times we have a microwave mentality in our life where we want our answer and we want it right now. And when we don't get our answer right now within five minutes, we're willing to give up and just forget it and just go running back with a negative report. And Gehazi comes running back with a negative report to the woman and to Elisha saying it didn't work. I did exactly what you told me to do, man of God, and it didn't work. You told me and I obeyed every command exactly like you told me to and that child is still dead. There's no answer. There's no provision. There's no miracle. The devil will always make sure he finds someone to get back into your life with a negative report. I want to make a comparison to the story of Job, for example. When Job lost everything in every single segment, the devil made sure there was always someone who could get a negative report back to Job to crush his heart and to break his heart, to hope that he would begin to lose faith in his heart toward God and he would curse God. And so it's almost like this same thing is going on with Gehazi. It's like Gehazi went there and expected something to happen in five minutes and it didn't happen in five minutes. And instead of sitting there and still obeying what the man of God told him to do, he immediately runs back and gives them the negative report and says it didn't work. So Elisha gets there and he goes into where the child is. He probably prayed first. I don't know exactly what he did. The Bible gives us a few details, but one thing that I do know is that he began to lay himself on the child. He laid himself exactly on the child. And you might ask yourself, well, why is he doing that? I want to tell you because it's a sign of a covering. It's a sign of a covering of the man of God covering this family with the anointing, with the power and the unction of God that resides in him at the office of a prophet. But as a child of God, as someone that God listens to because he's given his life to God and he spreads himself upon this child and 
and only a little bit happens, his flesh begins to grow warm. But Elisha does not give up. And that's one of the important things that I want you to take away from this story is Elisha does not give up up where Gehazi was willing to pray for five minutes and give up and so many of us sometimes we pray and we're desperate for a word from God and we pray for five minutes and we don't get an answer and we give up and it's like if you would just keep holding on I've got a word for you today I feel so burdened in my heart today for somebody please hear me you might feel like it's time to throw in the towel time to give up you've prayed you fasted you tried you got no answer you don't know where God's at and I'm telling you God wants me to tell you don't you give up don't you give up you keep praying and you keep striving you may feel well there's just been a little bit of blessing there's not really been a breakthrough but maybe I've seen something here or there I'm telling you don't you give up don't you give up don't you quit you've come too far to give up I'm telling you you've walked through too much you've been through too much hurt and too much burden to give up right now I'm telling you by the Holy Ghost don't you give up you keep fighting you keep praying you keep pressing through because Elisha continued to pray he got up on that child he laid himself covered that child with the anointing again and the Bible says that the life came back in that child and that child sneezed seven times and he called from the woman he called her up and he said come get your son and she got her miracle remember she didn't want to have her hopes up because she was afraid to lose it and it's just like in the book of Job when it says that the thing that he feared the most was the very thing that came upon him and so the thing that the woman of Shunem feared that was what came upon her she lost the child but I want you to know she went and got that man of God she went and got a power contact she went and got someone that knew how to get a hold of God and she got that power in her life and she got her miracle back she didn't have to live with crushed dreams she didn't have to live with broken heart she didn't have to lose everything that she wanted in her life she got it back because she persevered her own husband didn't even care if she went to the man of God the servants probably didn't even care if she went to the man of God they're all focused on their own life but she was focused on what was important to her and she continued to persevere and I'm so thankful that Elisha persevered too he was willing to fight through the fire with them now I want to move on in the story a little bit because we jumped through a couple of chapters here and, and I think this is amazing but I'm going to spare you going through all the scriptures but I want to bring out to you that the Bible begins to talk about a man named Naaman who was a Syrian and he was a very powerful general and the Bible says that there began to be raids that they began to raid into Israel and one of the things that happened on one of these raids was they kidnapped a little Israelite girl and in the process of the story you figure out that Naaman is a leper and he's going to die if he doesn't get healed and this little Jewish girl that's been kidnapped and taken away from everything that she knows in life she says oh I wish that you could get to my country because there's a prophet of God there and if you could get to him you would be healed and it's the exact same man I'm talking about Elisha and there's all these raids that are going on in to Samaria and the the Israelites are being attacked and being killed and being murdered by the Syrians and Naaman is a Syrian but the Bible goes through and it talks about all these stories about the raids and, and then there's famine and then the Syrian army is coming against them and their city gets to the place where it's so bad that the whole city is surrounded by this Syrian army because they're in the middle of a famine. And the famine gets so terrible and so desperate that the Bible says that the people are eating their own children and there's no animals, there's no food, there's no nothing left. They're in the middle of a terrible famine. In fact, one story that stands out to me in the middle of this is is that there was a woman that was exceedingly grieved and she hollered up the king who was walking on the city wall and he asked her what the problem was and, and this woman is just grieved and hurt and she says this friend of mine we we decided to eat my child yesterday that's got to be a terrible place to be in when you have to make the decision to to kill and eat your own child uh, to survive I don't I don't know how desperate you've got to be to do that but I thank God that I've never been in that kind of situation and I don't want to judge this woman for where she was at and what she was going through because if she dies the child dies and they're going to eat both of them I, I don't know what they're going through they're not thinking right but perhaps you've been in seasons and times in your life where it seems like there are no answers and and you're just as desperate you don't know what to do and you're grasping at straws yourself and so this woman they they eat her child and then the next day the other woman is taking her 
her child and hidden her child. This other woman might have talked her into doing it. This other woman might have told her, look, if you'll do this, if we'll eat your baby today, then we'll eat mine tomorrow, but you go first. And she talked her and convinced her into doing it. And I don't know if you've ever been in your life where you've given your trust to someone and you were so desperate it sounded like a good idea at the time only to live with regret for the rest of your life because of a bad decision that you made because someone else talked you into making a bad decision. Have you ever been so desperate or trust someone so completely that you made a decision only to find out that they were lying to you and betrayed you and took away something precious that was in your life? Well, this woman was going through that situation. And that's why I don't judge people in the Bible because I just thank God. But but by the grace of God, there go I. I don't want God to put me in that kind of situation to face those kind of choices, and therefore I don't judge her. But one thing that I do know that happened in the middle of this story is that the Bible says that there was four lepers who were sitting there, and they said, you know what, we're going to just sit here and die if we don't do something. Let's just go throw our hands at the mercy of the Syrians, and if they kill us, they kill us, and if they don't, they don't. And so these four lepers go down there, and God causes the enemy, the Syrians, to be put in confusion, and they all run off, and they leave us spoil. They leave money. They leave gold. They leave silver. They leave clothes. They leave their whole camp. And to make a long story short, the people of that city, they run out and they, they just receive the spoil of the war. But they had been through a terrible, terrible famine, a terrible grieving process. The children of Israel had been raided. They had been kidnapped. They had been murdered. They had been destroyed. They had been struggling through famine for years. And for years, they were in turmoil and trouble. In the process of this story, we even see where uh, Elisha, one day they were they were down by the riverside and this man was cutting with an axe and all of a sudden the axe head went flying in the water. I mean, Elisha can hear the voice of God and all he does is he takes a stick and he throws it in the water and all of a sudden the axe head comes floating up to the water and they grab it and retrieve it and they re repair the axe and put it back together. In the process of this time period, I see where they are struggling for something to eat and they have just a little bit of food there and, and Elisha says, put it before everybody and somebody had gone and got and some gourds and cut up some gourds and put it in the stew and it was like poison to them and they were almost all going to die and he said put some meal in there and when they put the meal in there it was all healed and restored them and they all were okay because of that. Why am I saying all of this and why am I putting all of this together because I'm painting a picture to you of what they were going through. They were in the middle of raids. They were in the middle of warfare. At one point in the middle of this story the Syrian army came because now they want to get Elisha because Elisha can hear the voice of God so clearly that he's warning the Israelite king, hey, don't go over here because the Syrian army is going to be here or they're going to be there and they're going to be over here. They're going to be all, and he's telling all the plans of the enemy to the Israelite king. And the Syrian king is so mad and so frustrated because all of his plans are being thwarted. And he calls all of his generals in there and he says, tell me who is on the enemy's side. Tell me what's going on because they know everything that we're going to do before we even do it. And they said, look, it's not us. We're not the problem. There's not a spy in the camp. There's no issue. The problem is that prophet Elisha is telling the Israelite king everything that we have going on. Can I tell you there is power with getting in contact with God and knowing what yea thus saith the word of the Lord is. Having a prophet in your life, having a man of God in your life so that God can tell you through the man of God, this is what you need to do. Don't go over there. The enemy's there. Don't get involved in that stuff. You don't need to be over there. All right, everybody. So I'm getting ready to come in for a close. If you can, I want you to start really paying attention because I'm bringing everything together. So the Bible has told us about all these things going on. There's been raids. There's been kidnappings. The enemy has come in. They've been creating war. They've surrounded the cities. They've tried to kill the prophet Elisha. They've done all of these things. All of this stuff is going on. But what I love is when you turn to 2 Kings chapter 8, <laughs> you oh, shut up. What I love is just so beautiful. The Bible doesn't always give you a play-by-play -play story. You understand that sometimes the Bible jumps around. It'll drop a character, and then it doesn't pick them up for chapters later. And we see this happen because when you go to 2 Kings chapter 8, you see that the story picks back up with the woman of Shunem. And what you see is that... The man of God, the prophet of God, Elisha, had come to the woman of Shunem and told her, he said, there's going to be a famine come in the land and you can go wherever you want to go, but I'm telling you to get out of the land because there's going to be a famine come. Why is that important? Because what I'm trying to tell you is that everything that I just detailed 
that they went through as a nation, the Israelite people went through as a nation, all the raids, the kidnappings, the murders, the killings, the death, the famine being so bad that the parents are eating their own children. There's no animals left because they've eaten them all. All the things that had gone on because the famine was so terrible. The man of God had already told the woman of Shunem before any of it even happened, get out of the land because there's a famine coming. And so the woman of Shunem and her whole family, that little boy that was raised from the dead, was able to get out of the country. They didn't have to face the war. They didn't have to face the raids. They didn't have to face the problems. They didn't have to worry about being murdered, about being kidnapped, about everything being stolen from them. They didn't have to worry about losing everything. He said, pick out the place you want to go. If I can say it like this, the man of God said, just pick out a place to go and get there and God's going to take care of you. But while she's there, she's living in a house that's not her. She's kicking her feet up on a coffee table that's not hers. She's looking at a sunset and a sunrise in a different house that's not hers. But she's able to bypass and miss all of the death and the destruction that was in that season for them. And what I love is when you see in those first few verses in 2 Kings chapter 8, you will see that after the famine was over that the woman came back, but somebody was living in her house and somebody was harvesting her fields. Now get a hold of this because this is what I've been leading up to about how when you don't hear the voice of God, just know and realize it could be because God's setting you up for something else in the future. Hear me, okay? Because now this woman comes back and guess what she does? She goes to the king. Now remember that Elisha at the very beginning of the story had said, do you want me to talk to the king on your behalf? Do you want me to talk to the captain of the host on your behalf? And she's like, no, no, I just, I dwell among my own people. I'm okay. Well, now she's going before the king. She begins to state her case, but lo and behold, guess how the timing of God works. Remember when Elisha was trying to get a word from God? If Elisha could have got a word from God for her in that moment, in that season, he could have sent a word and said, don't let your, field, don't let your kid go work in the field today. Make him take extra bags of water. Make him rest and relax today. He could have sent a word and averted the whole problem and averted the whole situation, but he couldn't get a word. And when that woman was come barreling across that desert sands, riding that horse or riding that donkey, trying to get there. He couldn't get a word and he's trying to receive for the woman and he can't get a word. Why? Because God was going to set him up to walk through a process where he was going to have to walk through hurt and work through heartache and heartbreak and loss. And he doesn't understand why the child has died and she doesn't understand why that miracle baby has died. But it's because the child is about to be raised from the dead. And that child was raised from the dead, not because of Gehazi, who was only willing to pray for five minutes, but because Elisha was willing to stand in the trenches and fight for that miracle. And so now here we are. And now here is Gehazi because the king is wanting to hear stories about Elisha. And here is Gehazi relating these stories to the king and telling the king everything that happened. And lo and behold, here comes this woman walking in. And Gehazi says, lo and behold, the very woman that I'm telling you the story about, there she is. And so she states her case to the king. And this is a symbol of you and I coming boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to find grace and help in time of need. And we come and we state our case. And this woman comes before the king and states her case. She's actually standing before the king and she lays it out. And he is so moved by the story of the boy being raised from the dead that he sends a appointed government official to go get her house back, go get her fields back. And not only that, but he commands that everything that she should have had for the last seven years be restored unto her. She got her house back. She got her crops back. She got her fields back. She got to put her curtains and her drapes back up. She got to put all the stuff back up that she wanted in her life. Can I tell you, my friend, that sometimes when you can't hear the voice of God and you don't know where God's at in your life, it's because God's got you set up for a comeback. He's got a miracle coming in your future. You don't know how. You don't see. You don't know when. You don't know where. But I'm telling you that God has got you in a place where he is going to bless you. David said, I was young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. 
can I tell you that sometimes you may not hear God, you may not see God, you may not know where God is at in your situation, but it might be because He's allowing you to walk through a process because that process and what you're going through right now is going to set you up for a miracle that is going to allow you to get back everything that you've lost in your life. For them, they did not understand why they were having to walk through the child dying. They didn't understand why they couldn't hear the voice of God. They didn't understand why they had to fight so hard to get the miracle and to get the answer. But God knew you're going to need this miracle somewhere down the road. You're going to need this testimony to stand before you. You're going to need it to come before the King. I know right now, child, you don't understand what you're going through. I know, child, right now you don't understand how come you're having to walk through this fire, walk through this trial, walk through this storm, walk through these dark clouds. But you don't understand right now. But I want you to understand that I know where you're at and I know what you're going through and I'm going to set you up for a comeback. So let me sum up this story like this because this woman recognized the anointing of the man of God in this life and she made room for God in her life. She got a miracle child that she couldn't have. When that child was taken away from her, she got a hold of the man of God and that child was raised from the dead. The man of God came to her and told her and said, there's gonna be a famine, come on the land. You can get out and go to wherever you want, go to whatever country you want to in the world, but get out of here because there's gonna be a famine in the land. And because she got out, she missed all of the raids. She missed the kidnappings. She missed the murders. She missed all of the struggles. She missed the heartache. She missed the heartbreak. She missed the loss. She missed all of that. And she was over there celebrating somewhere in the land of the Philistines while everybody else is back here in a terrible situation. And not only that, she got to come back and she got to go before the king. And when she went before the king, she made her petition and her request, and God had Gehazi standing there telling the very story that the king needed to hear to unlock his heart to get back everything that she had lost. And she got her house back, she got her fields back, she got everything back, and not only that, but the king said, everything that she should have had off that land for the last seven years, I want it to be restored to her right now. So right now in this season, perhaps you feel like you can't hear God. You don't know what you're going through. You don't know why you're facing it. You don't know what you're dealing with. You don't know where God's at. You're praying and you want to hear the voice of God. Perhaps you've got a man of God in your life and he can't hear from God either, but it might be because the process that you're walking through right now is a setup for a comeback. It's a setup that God is going to do something great in your life and you don't know how and you don't know where and you don't know how it's going to work out but God has got something powerful set up for you and it's going to be a blessing that's going to come upon you and God is going to work a miracle in your life and God is going to do something great and bold and wonderful in your life. I want to tell somebody here listening to me, don't you give up. Don't give up. I know. I know what I feel in my spirit right now and I want to tell everybody that's weary, that's heartbroken, that's struggling with a heavy heart. Your, your knees are weak. Your hands hands are heavy laden. Your shoulders are weary. You've been under a great weight. You've been under great stress. I want to tell you, don't give up, child. Don't give up. God knows exactly what you're going through right now, and He is going to see you through this thing. God is going to see you through. It's going to work out, and you're going to get it back. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I plead the blood of Jesus over everybody that's listening to this, watching this video. I command right now that everything that the enemy has stolen from you, everything that the enemy has taken from you, that it will be restored to you in due season, in due time. That every way that the enemy has tried to fight you as Daniel was resisted for 21 days, even though the answer had come from the very first day. Daniel fought for 21 days. So Sometimes the provision and the blessing and the answer is on its way, but we fight and we struggle through it. Even right now, I command everybody under the sound of my voice watching this, listening to this, I command right now that you do not give up, but you get a hold of your metal, you get a hold of your strength, you get a hold of your courage, and you say, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I don't have to, because God knows, and God sees, and God's going to bring me through this thing, and God's going to give me provision where there has been loss and where there's been heartache and heartbreak. God's going to bring me through this 
thing in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I command it to break off of you. I command it to loose you. I command every chain that's tried to get a hold of you. I command it to loose you right now in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I command every burden that's against you to be broken. Right now, I want you to open your heart and open your mind because I'm going to pray for peace to come upon you. <laughs> and you're going to feel a peace saturate you right now and come upon you. I want you to just block everybody out. Block everybody out. Block everything out of your mind. Block everybody out of your mind. I want you I want you to just open your mind and begin to receive peace right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, right now, I just call on your peace to come upon us right now from the top of our head to the sole of our feet. This stressful situation that we've all been walking through right now, God, you see it. It didn't catch you unaware. You know the end from the beginning. You know our end. You're the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning in the end. You know everything that we're going through. You see every trial and every tribulation. You see the attack of the enemy that's tried to come against us to steal the joy out of our lives. Even right now, I command the peace of God to come upon us right now. Just relax, child. Just relax. Peace of God come upon us right now. I just command there to be a peace of God. Just saturate us right now. Peace of God just flow through us right now. Holy Ghost, come right now. Holy Ghost, turn back the tide of the enemy. Holy Ghost, fight against the enemy's attack against us right now. God, let it turn for good. Let it turn for good. I receive your peace in this situation right now. I receive peace in this situation right now. I receive peace in this situation right now. I command it to turn for good right now in the authority of the name of Jesus. I command every heartache and every heartbreak to be turned for good right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All right, everybody, thank you for sticking with me through this video. I tried to make it as fast as I could for time constraint, but I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been enjoying the videos, sharing them, liking them, and just uh, spreading the word about these videos. I hope that they've been a blessing to you, and I just love you, and I appreciate you, and thank you so much, and I just want to leave you with this word that just know and trust that if you're walking through a process right now that you can't feel God and you don't hear His voice, child, don't give up. Do not give up because this thing is going to turn for good. Joseph didn't know and didn't understand how anything would be able to ever turn around for him. But in one day, he went from a prison to a palace. He went from living in rags to living in riches. You may feel like God is a thousand miles from you right now and you are getting no answers and you can't even feel God. But I want you to know you just do what Elisha did. You just keep on praying. You do what that woman of Shunem did. You get that voice of God and you don't give up no matter what your family's saying, no matter what your friends are saying, no matter what anybody else is saying in your life. Don't you give up. You keep on pushing until there's nothing left to pursue. I love you. Thank you so much for being here today. I love and appreciate you, and thank you for letting me share my heart. I love y'all. God bless you.